Welcome to NOAA Live Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Ruing, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This is the sixth webinar in a series that we designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. Today, we're intro introducing you to Chris Holderide from the NOAA's Kasitsna Bay Laboratory, part of NOAA's National Ocean Service, and Katie Gavinas from the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies in Homer, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local, local knowledge and much to share with us. So we're honored to acknowledge that Chris and Katie's work is done in the Kachemak Bay area near Homer, Alaska, the ancestral lands and waters of the Denaina and the Sugpiak Alutik people who have stewarded this area for thousands of years. We would like to also acknowledge that Katie is presenting from Squamish and Coast Salish lands in Washington state, and we are hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speakers. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go, and my colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of questions behind the scenes for Chris and Katie. They'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Chris and Katie to introduce themselves. Oh, I think you guys are muted. Okay, I think for... Ready for the next slide, Chris? Oh, that's me. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and let me get my cursor ready. There we go. And hello, everyone. It's really nice to be with you today. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. My name is Katie Gavanis, as Lisa said. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Hi, here in a moment. First, I just I'm wanted to, to there's a little there's bit a of little. Um, I don't know if there's a way we can stop that from happening, but I'll just keep going. Um, so I wanted to mention kind of where I come from and how I got into this work. I grew up in Homer on the shores of Kachemak Bay. And for the first eight or nine years of my life, uh, my family lived in a cabin, no running water or electricity, which meant no TV. Uh, so we spent a lot of, my sister and I spent a lot of our playing time outside. And then my dad is also a commercial fisherman, um, so I have a pretty strong connection to Kachemak Bay through his work and livelihood as well. So growing up, I loved exploring the nature of Kachemak Bay and had an opportunity to do a field trip in fourth grade with the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies, um, where I got to go tide pooling and see some of the animals you all are going to see in the slideshow later. And I fell in love and feel so grateful that now I get to do that um, as my job. And uh, the reason that I'm down in Washington State, as Lisa mentioned, is that this is where my husband and his daughter live. And so I spend some time in Washington State and then some time in Homer um, until we can figure out a different arrangement where I get to spend lots of time in Homer and lots of time with them. But for now, this works fairly well, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. And I'll pass it over to Chris. Thanks, Katie. And you can go to the next slide. So um, unlike Katie, I am I did not grow up in Homer or Ketchumike Bay, but I've been lucky enough to be here since uh, 2005. And I'm an oceanographer. Um, I've been lucky to do that my whole career. Um, I, you know, when I think about how I got started in oceanography, um, it really was my folks taking us to the ocean for fun since we were just <laughs> babies, I think, um, whether that's tide pooling in Maine or swimming in the ocean, the Maryland beaches, sailing on Chesapeake Bay. Um, and when I think about why I got interested really early in looking at things underwater and, and, and studying that, it goes back to those old TV shows in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Jacques Cousteau and Flipper. Um, I really think that had an influence. Um, I ended up going to the Naval Academy for my undergraduate and being an uh, oceanography officer in the Navy. 
um, and then have been with NOAA for the last couple of decades um, and was lucky enough to come uh, to Catch Mac Bay in 2005 as director of our uh, NOAA Kasitsna Bay Laboratory. And I'm, um, I'm a coastal physical oceanographer, so really interested in where ocean and freshwater meet. Um, and Catch Mac Bay is like the perfect place for that. Um, and Katie and I are just delighted to take you guys on a short tour of the bay today, um, as well as uh, looking at some of the ways that we work up here in Alaska. Next slide, please. So I wanted to orient you to where we are. So we're located in South Central Alaska. Um, and, you know, I think everybody knows that Alaska is um, uh, up, you know, way up north and we're next to Canada and we're across the Bering Strait from Russia. Um, but there are usually some questions, well, we know it's big, but, you know, how big is it? And so down in the lower left there, you can see Alaska over the continental U.S. And we're about 20 percent of the land area of the U.S. Um, the other way to think about that is if you took five Alaskas and added them up, that would equal the whole U.S. So it's a pretty big with uh, not that many people. So um, one of the things about our location in um, on Crook Inlet and um, near the Gulf of Alaska is we really are in this place where ocean water and fresh water from um, glaciers and ice fields are mixing and making a very, very productive marine environment. Next slide, please. And so zooming in on Kachemak Bay, this is a satellite image here on the left side. And um, Katie has and mentioned Homer, growing up in Homer, that's the larger community on the north side of the bay. Um, we also have, our lab is on the south side of the bay. And then there's a couple smaller communities, um, three native communities, Seldovia with Seldovia Village Tribe, Port Graham and Nanwalek. Um, and you can see here, you can kind of see all the white stuff on the right. So those are glaciers coming down to the bay and they have fine sediment there. And so the light color you see in the bay is really that fresh water running off. So you get the sense that this is a place where a lot of things are mixing together. Um, on the right hand side, you get, on the lower right, you'll see the Homer Harbor. And this productive area is supporting fisheries and recreation and marine commerce, really, really a vibrant area. Um, and then just to get a sense of what our, um, where our lab sits and what the south side of the bay looks like, you can see the mountains at the top right side. Next slide, please. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay here. In the yeah, it looks like here too. Wording. Well, and I'll just say, well, this rich marine environment produces a, a lot of really amazing animals. So whether it's a king salmon or a humpback whale and a lot of birds all eating the same little fish, um, sea otters, we have about 6,000 of them in just in Kachemak Bay, uh, puffins, octopus, it really, really is a vibrant environment, um, fun place to be, obviously. And, but what we're interested in is, is studying the environment where these animals live, um, the habitats they're in. And um, that brings me to a question for you guys. Next slide. So and I just use this word, but I'm just wondering what you think that might mean. So what is a habitat? What, and what specifically is a marine habitat? What do you think? So if you guys want to use your question box and write in, type in what you think a habitat is or what you think a marine habitat is, then we can see what you guys think a habitat is. So Pascal says where animal, that a habitat is where animals live. Uh, Mrs. Blewett's class from the Joint Base near Anchorage say that it's where organisms live. Alice and Paul say the place where marine animals live. Um, Eve says that as well. Um, Devoni says a place where critters can meet their life needs. So a lot of people are thinking about <laughs> where they live. Excellent. And any thoughts on when we say marine, what we mean there? So um, let's see. Actually, Isabella says a habitat is a balanced ecosystem where animals and plants are balanced. Um, and Paul was saying that marine means watery. Um, Devoni says it's in the ocean. Uh, Megan says it's underwater. Allison Paul says it's ocean. Oh, you guys are smart. So I have one more question um, related, and you guys have already mentioned this word, but what is an ecosystem? Someone had already said that. What do you think an ecosystem is? Okay. 
So actually, I think Jackson and Olivia were, were answering your previous question about marine. They were saying underwater living. Um, so who is some, someone was saying a habitat is a balanced ecosystem. Does anybody else have an idea of what an ecosystem is? So Alice and Paul were saying where one thing eats another, which eats that, it's a food chain. Paul says it's the circle of life. So what do you think about that, Chris? So if you go to the next slide, Lisa, I think they're exactly right. And I like the where one thing eats another. <laughs> so really, you know, in the simplest things, and you guys hit it right on, habitat is home, right? And that can be kind of the shape of the land, whether we're at a beach, a bay, an estuary, with you know, estuaries where fresh and salt water mix. Um, it could be like what's on the seafloor, the rock, sand, mud. We have all of that in Kachemak Bay. Or it could be created by the plants that are there. So whether that's kelp forest or seagrass meadows. Um, and marine, you guys hit that exactly right. It's, it's that we got the ocean involved, right? We have salt water. But also, in addition to the salt water, we have tides. Um, and in Kachemak Bay, that's a big deal because we have a 28-foot tidal range. So we have big tides that produce currents and create the intertidal habitat that we have here. And then ecosystem, you guys had that also right. It's the habitat plus everything that lives in it, right? Um, and that includes us. So I put the kayaker there because of that. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that makes Kachemak Bay such a rich place for all those animals is that we have a lot of underwater habitat. So we have the kelp forest and we have the rocky intertidal produced by those big tides um, and the rock underneath and what grows on it, but also seagrass meadows and the shallower water, mud flats with, with clams and other invertebrates and salt marsh. So we're working in all these habitats to understand um, how they, you know, what's changing in them and how it might affect all those animals that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and Katie, we're going to talk about two things today. Um, I'm going to talk later about working in the kelp forest, and Katie's going to talk about the rocky intertidal. But yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Um, okay. And then just to show you a couple of things about the kelp forest, there are um, two basic types of kelp. Um, one are called canopy kelps, and you can think of that like it's a canopy up top. Um, they tend to be tall. There's a the couple of bull kelp there. And um, one of the things that amazed me when I came here is bull kelp can grow 35 feet in a couple months. I mean, it's crazy how fast they grow. Um, but equally important are the understory kelp. So the ones at the bottom. And you can imagine that that's a lot of hiding places and good habitat um, for some of the animals in the bay. So um, that's our intro to Ketchmack Bay. Katie is gonna talk here about the intertidal um, what we find in the inner title, but I'll stop for a minute to see if anyone has any questions. Well, um, actually, actually, I'm going to turn off your turn off my display here so that I can put you on. Um, but in the meantime, um, Megan was asking what are kelp, and I think you answered that question. But um, she was think she was wondering, um, you know, would you classify them as plants or um, seaweed or i mean i guess seaweed are plants but how would you and class that, how would you yeah that's a, that's a really good question so seaweed so kelps are a type of seaweed is one way you can think about it right they're an underwater plant um and they grow all the way from the inner tidal so where there's where you have um it goes uh it, the, it'll be covered by water and then not covered by water so that's what the, the inner tidal is the tides will go below and then come up up and there's some like the canopy kelps that will only grow um subtidally so where they're always covered by water um but yeah they're all plants and they all photosynthesize and they're part of what makes it such a productive environment great well we don't have that many questions right now, so I want to encourage people to type in their questions, but I did want to give a shout out to Clark from Clark and Harmony who are watching on Facebook because um, Clark said in answering your um, question about ecosystems um, that it's rocks and tide pools. Um, and Megan had one right. just before we go. Megan wanted to want wanted to know what is the tallest kelp? How big do they get? Well, the ones in Ketchumac Bay will get to about 35 feet. Um, kelps in other areas can get taller because the water is clearer. 
So we have so much plankton and so much sediment in the water, and you'll see that on some of the videos later on, that it limits, kelps need light, right? They're plants, they need light to grow. Um, so that's, that's about the, the tallest that we see in the bay. Okay, and we're now getting some more kelp questions, so I'll take one or two more before we move, move um, ahead. But Paul had wanted to know, how many kelp forests are there in Alaska? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. And um, some of the technology that I'll show you later on is ways that we're trying to figure that out in smarter ways. So there are a lot, um, particularly in the Gulf of Alaska where we are um, and along the Aleutians and in Southeast, there's, there's lots of them. And then Oliver had wanted to know, why can seaweed be different colors? Why are they different colors? Well, if you think yep. about it, it's kind of like trees and plants are different colors. Um, they're using sunlight in different ways. And if you think about it, a, a leaf that's up at the top of the water, it's gonna be getting a lot of sunlight, most of the different wavelengths. So it, it has a color to take advantage of that. But if you're lower in the water, you're not getting all the same light. You know how the light gets bluer or greener as you get deeper? So the plants are, are, are um, geared towards using the light the best way. So they have different colors. So you okay. usually end up with greener algaes are closer to the surface. And then as you go deeper, you get into reds and then brown algaes are the kelp that Chris is talking about. They're the best at taking every little tiny bit of light that's there and being able to photosynthesize with it. Okay, and, and then should, Liam had wanted point to point out know. that, um, and, and here most of the biology questions should go to Katie. Um, because I'm the oceanographer and I, I work with biologists, but she knows more about the biology. <laughs> okay, and then one last question before we move on. And um, Liam had wanted to know what eats kelp. So, well, lots, urchins are the ones that um, most people know about. So, and they can really eat a lot of kelp. They can create a, a kelp barren, ur urchin barren where there's no kelp. Katie, do you want to add some more? Um, lots of different species of uh, fish and crab will eat kelp. People eat kelp. Chris mentioned that people are an important part of the ecosystem and in Kachemak Bay, kelp is a really important food source for some people. Um, and all sorts of other animals will also eat when the kelp starts to like deteriorate and degrade, then there are animals that feed on that um, sort of decaying matter that falls to the ocean floor as well. Lots of worms love rotting kelp. I have to say, kelp pickles are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's move ahead then and see whether we can get go to our next section. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Chris. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about what lives on our beaches and in the near shore and some of those things that we started to talk about when we were talking about what eats kelp. Um, we're going to focus first on invertebrates. So these are animals that don't have a backbone. This is a great time if you want to, you can stand up, you can feel your backbone, you can reach back, check that it's still there. You have a backbone, you are a vertebrate. We're gonna talk about invertebrates. So these are animals, like I said, that don't have a backbone or a spinal cord. Um, and scientists oftentimes like to categorize animals. So we're gonna talk at the phylum level. So this is, if you think of animals, the next division is oftentimes into phylum. So we're gonna talk about four main phyla, um, that are really common in the intertidal areas of Kachemak Bay. So that's between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. And then Chris is gonna talk about even farther down below that low tide mark in the subtitle. So the first phylum I wanna talk about are echinoderms. They have spiny skin, they have two feet, they have a hydrovascular system. So that means that water powers their body um, rather than blood and muscles. They have radial symmetry, um, so that's like if you imagine a pizza or a pie, each slice is very similar. Um, so it's kind of that circular symmetry. And they have the amazing ability to regenerate parts of their body if they lose them. Can anyone think of an example of any kind of derm that might live on a beach near you or that you've learned about before? You can type so it into the if you box. Can, yeah, so if you can think of any kinds of animals that might fit into this group of echinoderms that have spiny skin and tube feet, um, type it into your question box and we'll see. So 
what what I'm seeing is people are saying Paul is saying starfish, Thomas is saying sand dollar, Pascal is saying starfish, a lot of people saying starfish. Um, Texas says urchins. Um, Alice and Paul say octopus. Uh, Karina says sea cucumbers, and Mona says my dad. <laughs> I cannot speak for your dad. I do think he probably has a backbone, so he probably isn't falling into this phylum, but if you want to go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, yeah, so sea stars are a really common type of echinoderm. Sea cucumbers I heard mentioned, sand dollars, sea urchins, brittle stars, which is in the bottom right photo there, um, are all really great examples of echinoderms. I heard octopus, that's actually in a different phylum. Um, they don't have that hydrovascular system, so they're actually using muscles to move their body, the octopus is, um, and they have a pretty different setup. Um, we'll find a little bit out a little bit more about them in a moment, but first I wanted to share with you one of my favorite echinoderms. Lisa, if you'll go to the next slide. This is the sunflower star. These can get grow to be over three feet wide, so like extra large pizza size. Um, and they're incredibly fast. They're the second fastest sea star on record. Um, so they use that hydrovascular system to cruise through the kelp forest and the tide pools in search of food. Um, and they actually love to eat, eat sea urchins, um, but they also will eat mollusks, um, bivalves like clams or mussels, and they push their body out of their stomach, digest the clam, and then suck it back in. So they are just really amazing and fascinating examples in this echinoderm phylum. Okay, let's go to the next phylum. Mollusks have a strong muscular foot, a soft body. They have bilateral symmetry, so that's kind of two-side symmetry. Um, they have a mantle, which is a strong body part um, that oftentimes helps them to get oxygen. And many have a shell, but not all. Can anyone think of examples of mollusks that you can put in the question box? Okay, so if you can think of an example of a mollusk, of something that has, might have a shell, might not have a shell. Um, I see several people saying clams. Um, somebody said octopus, somebody said steamers, oysters, mussels. So a lot of, lot of shelled mollusks. And um, somebody said clam and scallop. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of clams. Yeah, if you can go to the next slide, you are all correct. Um, bivalves like clams and mussels and cockles are a really um, important part of the mollusk phylum, but there's also mollusks that have one shell instead of two, um, like snails and limpets. And then there are mollusks that have many shells, like chitons, the picture in the upper right, they have eight plates that allows them to kind of curl up like a pill, pill bug um, if they're off the rock. Um, and then there are uh, mollusks that don't really have a shell at all, like octopus or squid, um, or my personal favorite, nudibranchs. And if you want to go to the next slide, Lisa, um, we can show you an example of nudibranchs. So nudibranchs are amazing animals. Um, they are a shellless mollusk. Um, they're also called sea slugs. And one of my personal favorites is the one on the left. This is an opalescent nudibranch or hermacenda nudibranch. And they have the amazing ability, as do some of the closely related nudibranchs, of being able to eat the stinging tentacles off of sea anemones and hydroids, process them through their own body and put them on their back for defense. So that's like if I ate an entire porcupine, quills and all, and then the next day the quills poked out on my back to help keep me safe. It's a really amazing uh, adaptation to life in the ocean environment that allows them to get food and protect themselves so they don't end up being food. And it's pretty amazing. I also will note with mollusks, as many of you mentioned, that a lot of mollusks, not new to Branks as far as I know, but a lot of mollusks are a favorite food for people as well. So it's another good connection to the ecosystem in Catchmack Bay. I wanted to say, I wanted to give a shout out to Murray from Facebook who, who had, had talked about nudibranchs too. So um, I think that they're one of the prettiest um, invertebrates that you can see underwater. Okay, Katie, I think that uh, we're gonna stop for questions, but it looks like Katie might have, um, um, her connection might've gotten a little bit, um, um, 
pardon, uh, uh, she might have uh, lost her connection. So, Chris, I wonder whether you can come on to answer some questions. And in in the meantime, um, hopefully Katie can can get get off and get back on again. Um, so <laughs> I'm seeing some biology questions which you may not be comfortable with <laughs> with answering. So we might have to wait for Katie for those ones. But I did have some other questions. There there were some kelp questions left over. Um, Alison and Paul were saying, do different kelp have different sized leaves? Um, meaning if they're deeper, do they have bigger leaves because they need to reach the light? Yeah, that's a really good question. And different kelp have different strategies. So the bull kelp have a long stipe and their leaves are up at the top. And so that, that's a strategy where they have their, their leaves close to the sunlight, right? Um, so that's great. That seems like, hey, everyone should do that. But then if you have a long stipe, you know, you, you're a little prone to getting ripped off too. So you have to have a really strong attachment. Um, so that's what they've developed. There's other kelp that have um, leaves all up and down the, the kelp itself. So they're kind of trying to take advantage of light throughout the um, water column. And then there's those, we saw some pictures of them for the understory kelps that, that just almost look like a, a blanket of, you know, big leaves at the bottom. Um, and so they're all using a little bit different strategies and it depends also on, because they have to be anchored to something, right? They're not, they're not floating. Um, they have to be anchored. And so it's this combination of taking advantage of light, but also having a place to be attached to. Um, that that and then they find all these different niches, which is why it's just amazing underwater. It's like you're in a hole, literally in a forest with all sorts of different um, types of plants there. And then Michelle had wanted to know, is kelp spicy? I think she heard you talking about kelp pickles. And so she wanted to have an idea of what they might taste like. Yeah, it, it, it they taste, you know, it's, it's a funny thing to say. They taste kind of like the sea. <laughs> because they have that sort of salty briny taste is what you get and sometimes it's a little sweet sometimes not with the pickles it's it's like pickles with cucumbers right it, the, the spices that you put into it will create um that particular part of the taste and people will also take um bull kelp and turn it into salsa use it like uh, like you would use a tomato all right um we also had a couple of sunstar questions i was wondering whether you might be able to handle those um one of them uh, Thomas had wanted to know, are sun stars still fairly abundant? And I know that Katie was going to touch on that a little later. Yeah, that's a good question. We've actually had um, all across the North Pacific here, um, and uh, including up in Alaska, we've had a loss of the sea stars due to, including sun stars, due to sea star wasting disease. Um, and we're starting to see hints that they're coming back. Um, and we really hope that's true, because um, as Katie mentioned, they're they're one of the big predators in the intertidal. And so if you lose them, you're you know, not just losing them to be able to see them and that they're cool, but they help, they're, part, they're a big part of the ecosystem. Um, so we're hopeful that they're coming back, but we've had a loss since about 2014, 2015 has been a big loss. So it's one of the things we're keeping an eye on. Okay. Okay. So I'm wondering if we wanted to jump ahead, just looking at time. Well, I just heard Katie. Um, Katie, can you put your, your camera on? So the power went out here, which means okay. that the Wi-Fi isn't working. Um, okay. But I'm on the phone. Okay. Well, we can go ahead with, if you know your slides, we can get your slides back up and go to your next section. Yes, I think I know them well enough. And just So now we're on the arthropod I slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, in our the next phylum that I want to talk about is arthropods. Arthropods, um, that means jointed legs, so they have jointed legs. They have an exoskeleton, which is the skeleton is outside of their body, um, and they molt that exoskeleton. So, as they grow, they leave that skeleton behind, and they create a new one, which is pretty amazing. Um, they also have bilateral symmetry, so that two-sided symmetry we were talking about earlier. Um, and that they have, like I said, that exoskeleton or that shell on the outside. Um, can anyone think of examples of arthropods near where you all live? 
Okay, so Pascal is saying crabs and lobsters. Dana says crabs. Thomas says shrimp. A lot of crabs and shrimp. Yeah, that's that's about what we're having right. Yeah, a lot of crabs and shrimp so far. So let's Great. let me see if I can get to the next slide here. If I can find my yeah. cursor again. There we go. Well, those are all examples of arthropods. Um, a few that you didn't mention are hermit crabs. Um, so they live in a mollusk shell. They live in a snail shell where the snail has died, but they have their own exoskeleton too. Um, isopods, uh, which is that picture on the lower right, and amphipods, also called beach hoppers or, or um, beach fleas or sand fleas, and then barnacles. So barnacles may not look like an arthropod at all, but they actually have um, kind of a shrimp-like body inside of that bigger white volcano shell. Their head is glued to the rock and then their feet, they pick those jointed legs out into the water to grab plankton out of the water. And they do in fact molt that exoskeleton. Sometimes you can find those little feathery um, exoskeletons on the beach where the barnacles have molted. And Lisa, if you'll go to the next slide, my absolute favorite arthropod is this decorator crab. So they um, will take algae, seaweed, kelp, other items from the environment and stick it onto their own shell um, for camouflage. So this allows them to avoid um, being uh, nabbed by predators because they're better able to hide in that kelp understory or kelp forest habitat that Chris was describing. Cool. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So now we're on the Nidarian slide. Excellent. So Nidarians have a soft, gelatinous, or jelly-like body. They have stinging cells. They have a simple digestive system. This is what I sometimes refer to as a potty mouth because all the food goes in one hole and all the waste comes back out that same hole. And um, like our echinoderms that we talked about earlier, they also have that radial symmetry. Um, so they have that kind of pie slice symmetry. Are there any ideas out there of what um, some of our Nidarian friends might be? So um, Thomas was saying, corals and Anthony was asking is the sea silent and it sounds like it is if you're saying Nidarians and the sea is silent there. Um, yes. Pascal is saying jellyfish. Um, Alice and Paul say jellyfish as well. Texas says sea anemones and jellyfish. Lots of jellyfish question, uh, guesses. Nice. So if you'll so, go to the next slide you'll find in fact yep. that those suggestions are all um, absolutely correct. Jellies, anemones, and corals are all Nidarian. Um, hydroids are also an example of a Nidarian. They're kind of a combination between a sea anemone and a coral. They're pretty common in Catchamac Bay, actually. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just one of my favorite photos of a Nidarian and a vertebrate. So can you all see the fish in this photo? Can you find the fish? Here's, yep, here's the fish. And when I first looked at it, I couldn't figure out which way the fish is looking. Here's the fish's eyes, and here's the fish's lips here. So it's looking this way. But so once you figure out where the lips are, you can kind of figure out the, the head, what the head of the fish looks like. And so what did you so say this, that the fish was on? Yeah, so this poor fish, this is a sculpin. Um, and I don't know exactly what happened to ruin this sculpin day in the first place. Um, but somehow the sculpin died, possibly because a sea otter came along and ate the back half of it. And then it drifted into the intertidal zone and got grabbed by a Christmas sea anemone. So on the right hand side of this photo, you can see all the kind of glossy, um, almost they almost look like fingers. Those are the tentacles of the sea anemone that it uses to sting the prey and also to pull the prey in. And so this sea anemone got really fortunate that the big meal washed in, able to grab that and pull that fish in and bring it um, into uh, its digestive cavity where it will digest what it can and any bones or other parts it can't digest will get spit back out. And um, this is the second coolest thing I've seen eaten by a sea anemone. The coolest was a dead seabird that washed ashore and the sea anemone digested it, pulled it in head first and slowly worked its way um, digesting the entire body of that gull, um, which was pretty amazing to see. Okay, okay Lisa, if you go to the slide. next slide. 
those are um, the four phyla that are most common to find in the intertidal zone of Kachemak Bay, but there are so many other phyla that are represented. Um, there are many, many different types of sponges that grow in these ecosystems, lots of different species of marine worms, and as we mentioned already, there are vertebrates, so there are animals with backbones. In the right-hand picture, um, these are sculpin eggs that we found, um, and every clump of eggs is a different color because there's a different uh, female sculpin laying those eggs. So they lay them all together underneath the rocks, but you can pick out each patch because it's a little bit of a different color. And so there's an incredible amount of biodiversity in Kachemak Bay, um, and the intertidal zones are one place where you can really sense for that and some pretty amazing animals. Okay, um, so now... Lisa, do we want to go to questions or do we want to um, play the video? We can play the video. I was wondering whether, you, would you be able to still narrate the video or... <laughs> Um, you won't be able to see can, it, I guess. I can huh? do my best to narrate the video. It's going to be a little tricky okay. about being able to see the timing. So forgive me for the major technological difficulty with the power. I'm sitting here in the dark as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate how um, how uh, tenacious you've been in um, getting back on the webinar. So um, so I'm just loading up the 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 um, video now, I'm about to start it. So here we go. So we talked a lot about individual organisms and categories, but one of the coolest things to think about is how organisms interact. And I think you're seeing a sunflower star. As I mentioned, these are voracious predators. They cruise through the tide pool and you can see it moving along, probably maybe in search of a sea urchin or a clam or a cockle um, as part of that giant food web that makes up Kachemak Bay. You'll also probably see greater crab. Look closely. Um, if you don't look very closely, it might look just like a tiny piece of algae in the tide pool. But once it starts moving, you can see that decorator crab crawl on through. Um, they're not uh, particularly predatory crabs. They're mostly feeding on um, algae and detritus and other small organisms in the tide pools. Um, and I don't know if it's happening quite yet, but you may see that crab reach out and actually pluck a tube foot off of the sunflower star. I'm not sure why I did that. I don't know if it was for decoration or um, maybe a snack. And then hopefully Pretty now yet. you're starting to see this amazing giant Pacific octopus. This is a small one, so in these titles we usually only find octopus that are one to three or four feet long, but they can grow up to 10 feet from the top of the head to the tip of their tentacle. And they are an amazing part of the ecosystem. Food for lots of animals, like sea lions and seals and fish, but also a voracious predator themselves, um, consuming lots and lots of crabs and mollusks as well. Speaking of consuming crab and mollusks, uh, now we probably have the sea otter popping up. And you might even be able to hear it chomping on some food. They love to come into the internet and find um, biomass and other food. And they're not the only animals that come down to the beach. Others will also come down to the beach. In this case, you're probably seeing them in the salt marsh where they're feeding plants. Um, but they also will come down to the rocky intertidal where they will scrape barnacles and mussels off the rocks to eat. And in the more muddy environments, they'll also dig up clams to eat. Um, but it's a pretty amazing uh, food web that connects land well, thank you for for narrating that. It was you you got it pretty much right on. I think right at the end, the sea otter went came and went pretty quickly. But um, we do have a few questions that we'll take before getting back to Chris. Um, uh, Oliver had said that they saw a Christmas anemone eating a jellyfish, and we're wondering how did it not get stung by jellyfish? That is a really good question, and I don't think it's a question that anyone necessarily has the answer to. Um, I've seen probably the most common thing that I've seen Christmas anemones feeding on are jellies. Um, so they're, you know, feeding within the same cycle there, which is also kind of interesting. Um, but one thing that we do know is that sea anemones, even of the same within the same species, can sting each other. Some species of sea anemones will actually kind of 
battles, um, they have the ability to um, reproduce by basically cloning themselves. And so you'll get one patch of sea anemones on the rock that's all related and another patch on the other side of the rock that's all related. And they each other across the gap to establish their territory. So how do the Christmas anemones avoid being stung by something like a lion's mane jelly? I don't know, actually. Um, <laughs> But it's a good, one it's a really good question. All right. Well, um, I think we're running a little bit behind because of our, our power outage. So I think we'll move on to Chris's section. But thank you for coming back on, on the phone, um, Katie. I yeah, think that's no great. no problem. And I think um, maybe we'll just, after Chris's section, we'll kind of skip to the very last slide that I have. And then if there are questions about um, sea star wasting syndrome, I'm happy to take Okay. That. Sure. I heard that mentioned. That sounds great. Thanks, Katie. Way to make that work. Um, and so, you know, Katie was talking about what we see on the inner tidal lands, the, the things you can walk to, right, when the tide is low. Um, and we do a lot of that work at our at our uh, laboratory, but we also want to get below the water. Um, and so, what I want to show you now is, hey, how do we do that? Like, how do you, you know, you can look at something at the inner tidal when you're walking along, but you can't do that so easily underwater. So we'll take a we'll take. Um, uh, a look at some of those and I just want to say to start with that um, this is all a whole bunch of people helping out with this um, so it's uh, yeah Lisa go back one slide now if you skip ahead. yeah um, it, it yeah <laughs> yeah P particularly from our partner uh, partners with the University of Alaska Fairbanks um, at our laboratory and so here's the thing is like Okay, I want to see these things, right? This is now below the inner tidal. This is where it's always covered with water, whether that's in the middle of the kelp or whether that's down where those beautiful fringing and enemy are. You know, I want to and I want to get up close and personal sometimes. Like that's a hermit crab there on the lower right. So, you know, how do we do that, right? So there's a couple different ways. Next slide. And you know, part of it is hey, you use cameras. But then how do you get a camera down there? And the way that you guys have um, probably thought about already is that divers, right? Yeah, you can take divers down there. We can also use a really simple device, which is a drop camera. So literally it's what you what it sounds like. You put a camera on a line and you put it over the side and I'll show you that. Um, or we can get a little more, more fancy and use remotely operated vehicles. So something that has the ability to move around on a tether or an autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, and that's something that's that autonomous means that it's it's not attached to a tether, so it's running by itself. So I'm going to talk about the first three of those, some of the things we're doing in Ketchumac Bay. I do want to give a shout out to our our NOAA colleagues who do the mapping of the bottom with sound. Um, that's another way of seeing underwater. Uh, next slide. So divers, right? So so in especially in Ketchumac Bay. Um, we do a lot of this work out of our lab and it's, you know, you can get up close and personal, you can make measurements, you can collect samples, um, you can take pictures, you can take video, you have a lot of control. Um, the water is cold, so all the divers that you see here, they're in dry suits, um, which is kind of what you think it is. It keeps you dry, um, which is one way of staying warmer in cold water. Um, but divers are limited in their depths. Um, typically, you know, you're around 100, going to about 100 feet routinely. Um, NOAA divers, I think their maximum is 140 feet. We've got up to 600 feet in Ketchumac Bay, so we need ways to get deeper than that. Uh, next slide. And so one way we can do that is, is pretty simple. It's, I mentioned the drop camera. So the, the frame for it is there on the left. And what that is, it's a metal frame. It has, it's a tripod, mainly to protect the cameras. And it has two cameras on there. And these are just, one of these is just a GoPro, right? But you guys might, might use. And the other is attached to that black cable that runs up to the small boat that we're working on. And so that black cable comes up and we're um, here, Don and Tami are, are working on the computer. And there's two computers set up for them. So, because if you think about it, if I'm looking at something on the bottom, I want to see what's there, but I also need to know where I am, right? So I can use those pictures and know where they were. So the top monitor the, um, computer there is actually showing the location and it's recording the location. And the bottom one is 
doing a uh, is showing a picture from the second camera on the drop, drop camera. So literally, you put it over the side like uh, Dom and Amit are doing there. You hand over hand down to the bottom. You watch it on the monitor. When it gets close, you stop. And then it's like a it's like a, a orchestra, right? It's working together as a team. Person on the line is listening to the person in the boat, and you're and then the boat of, is moving. So you know you're trying to make this all work. Um, so it's pretty interesting, but it's it's pretty effective. Um, so that's one way that we look at the bottom, and we've got some um, a video to show about that, and then I can take some questions. Okay, so I am going to load up the video here. And then while I'm loading it up, um, we are going to, I'm just going to remind um, Chris that that uh, you'll be muted when, once the video starts, so you'll have to unmute yourself to. Okay. Um, okay, so here we go. So this is just putting it over the side, and if you'll listen here, they'll talk about how deep it is. How deep are we? Uh, 91. Wow. Yes. 91 feet? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So the part that's fun there is if you see how close we are to shore, <laughs> it gets deep quickly. Now this is some footage and take a peek and see if you can see the fish and how many fish you see. So this is kelp and boulders. Really nice habitat for, for that size fish to hide out. So it gives you a sense of what the what the drop cam is 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 uh, capable of. Um, but you saw how we were moving there, right? So you don't have as much control. So at least if you go to the next uh, slide, I can take some uh, questions if there are any. Okay, um, so um, <laughs> Pascal said that she saw four fish, and we were wondering how many fish there actually were in there. She saw four. She's close. I, there are three, but there's things that also look like fish, <laughs> which <laughs> why it makes it a good hide, hiding place for them. And then um, Texas had had a question a couple of. Uh, about how the hydrovascular system of the of the starfish works, the sea stars work. And so I know that that is a biology question. I wonder whether Katie is still on the line and could answer that one. I am still on the line. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the sea stars and the urchins and the cucumbers, they all have um, this ability to pull in water. Um, some of them do it just through their surface. Some have special um, parts called a madreporite that's like a sieve plate that they pull the water in, and then they pump it through their body. Um, and it's sort of like if you've ever worked on a boat that has hydraulic systems, it's like that. It's using a fluid to fill up tubes um, that then moves them. And it's really, really cool. And then they also use that hydrovascular system to move nutrients around their body and to help move waste out of their body. So it's pumping water to different parts of the body to, to have those body parts move or to um, transport things. I think we should probably keep moving because I know you have a couple yeah. more videos to show. So I'm gonna get to the next slide here. And they oh, are sorry. fun. <laughs> I skipped ahead. So I'm gonna go back one, sorry. Yeah, so, so the yeah. other is we can use a remotely operated vehicle. And this is one that has um, little motors and engines so it can move in three dimensions. It's attached to a tether. Um, so that yellow cord that you see in the in the bottom left is a is a tether and it's communicating there. And you know this is run off a small boat. So similar to the drop camera, we're not talking big boats and big equipment. We can do it right in our backyard. Um, but similarly, it's being run, the operator is looking at a monitor and running it based on what he sees on in this case this is josh hank and foley what he sees on the monitor so you, you gotta you gotta be good about understanding sort of where you are in space um because you can't look at it directly once it's underwater um next slide and one thing you might think about is well if it's if it's out there and you have these big tides and currents like how do you 
how do you keep track of it and how does it not you know get dragged off with the current and all those things and it's pretty interesting the way they do this so they put down a weight which is called a clump weight um, and you can see the diagram over there um, and also a picture of it that was taken from the ROV camera on the right. Um, and so that goes, so first the ROV goes out. So you can see at the bottom right, there's a, the tether going out. So you put the ROV out, get it away from the boat. You put the clump weight down and that line runs through a pulley on the weight. And what that does is now, the ROV has a has an attachment point, but a but a movable attachment point on the bottom, and that makes it a lot easier to drive. So, did you want to show the video here? Uh, that's just a that's just a still screen. Okay. All right. Here we go. So if you if you go to the next slide, then um, we'll show the video here. And what I'm going to show you here. Are, um, is just an example of one of the places in Kachemak Bay that's too deep for the um, divers to go, but the ROV was able to go and it found some interesting critters. Um, and then okay, I'll show so you the capabilities of the, uh, the ROV in addition. Okay, so here we go. go ahead. So this is in <laughs> Cove and got down there on that on that muddy bottom and it's full of shrimp and they all seem to be paying close attention to the rov <laughs> not surprisingly but you can see what great control um, that you have with this it's pretty this is about 186 feet down so pretty deep but you can also put tools on the rov and um again this is picking up a can um just outside homer harbor demonstrating how um, this was a test of the tool, you know, how good these tools are. So it's really a capable platform, a little bit harder to operate, um, but really capable platform for working underwater. Okay. So... And then we're going to move into another video, um, if you go to the next slide. Okay. And this is kind of some of the surprising things that can happen um, when you put equipment underwater. So this is Jesse Ross, who is a graduate student from UNH, was working at our lab for a couple summers. And he has this sediment trap that's a four piece that you put underwater and sediment comes in. And um, he had a camera there to look at, make sure it was upright. And this is what the camera caught. Okay, I'm about to. So this octopus is about the same size as the one that Katie showed you in the uh, in the intertidal video. Um, it is absolutely not what he expected would happen with his sediment trap. But you know, this is a curious octopus. Um, and again, about you know, it kind of fit. This would this would fit about in the the palm of your hand. So it's uh, pretty amazing what you find when you put cameras um, underwater, even in places that you don't expect it. Of course, the only thing here was the uh, the sample wasn't so good because he was now blocking the sediment from getting in. <laughs> <laughs> Those octopuses are really curious. They are very curious, yes. Yeah, we really okay. didn't expect to see this at all. Um, and then I'll just end this section. So one of the things that we do at our lab, um, in addition to research is we do, we have a lot of internships and we do a lot of um, scientific dive training. And we have a class um, that does their uh, scientific dive training every year during spring break, which is in March. So yes, it's a little bit cold, but that's good training in cold water diving. Um, and this is a video that one of the students put together a couple of years ago about the class. And it's like a, a movie trailer. Here we
that's all I had on this section. I can take questions. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for that. And then Katie will do it for us. Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, Mrs. Blewett's class was wondering how heavy the drop camera is. Yeah, it's only about maybe 20 pounds total. It's a stainless steel frame, so that that's a little bit heavy, but it's pretty easy to, to put up and down. And then... Um, that was a good question. <laughs> um, so one of the questions was, what qualifications do you need in order to get um, on one of the research vessels? Do you need any experience at sea at all? Yeah, it depends. Um, in some cases, you don't. There's programs for getting out. Um, NOAA, for example, trains people to be fishery observers to get out on the, the fishing vessels. Um, on our ships, we have people, like there's folks like myself who are oceanographers who have that training, but there's folks who are deckhands, there's folks who are engineers, there's folks that drive the ships. Um, there's folks for the, for the boats that do the mapping that um, work with the sonar systems for the mapping of the bottom. Um, and all of these have routes to get in there. Um, and the NOAA, one of the ways to check things out is that NOAA Education Office has some really good um, website links for uh, those kind of programs on the NOAA side, at least. Great. And then there were a couple of questions about the Pepsi can at the bottom of the ocean. Anthony was wondering, <laughs> why was there a Pepsi can at the bottom of the ocean? And Anne was wondering, with the grabber, can you pick up trash to help climate change? Can it, and it can it pick up what to help climate change? I didn't. Trash. Oh, trash. Yeah, I mean, so it, it was probably there because I did mention there's a lot of recreational boating out of the bay. And so things can, you know, people can accidentally drop things. Hopefully they're not intentionally dropping anything. Um, I would say you, you can get marine debris with an ROV. It's probably not the most effective way to get that. Um, so, but there, there would be certain areas, um, and there are some places where like fishing um, gear gets tangled up, uh, like in a, you know, subtitly on a coral reef, that it might be the best way to get there, it might be to use an, an ROV um, to break it loose, especially if uh, it's, a, it's a particularly sensitive area. So that it is used in particular cases. Um, it wouldn't be probably the effective way to do it on a big scale. Okay. Well, we have only a few minutes left, so I've actually advanced the slideshow slideshow to the um, the slide that Katie had with all of the um, the citizen science on it. So, Katie, if you wanted right. to to talk about that slide very briefly, yeah, I would just um, encourage you all, wherever you may be living, um, to get involved with science where you live, and this might look like getting involved with coastal science like Chris and I spoke about or it may be in the forest or the tundra or even you know I saw Texas even somewhere in the desert um, but there are lots of different ways from making personal observations submitting your observations to a broader ne network collecting specific data on weather precipitation birds butterflies um, and then there are also opportunities to get involved with internships um, both with the Kasitsna Bay Lab and NOAA programs and the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies volunteering um, with a local organization or science camp, um, both in Kachemak Bay and wherever you may live. So hopefully this has inspired you all to um, get uh, involved in science at home. And thanks for your patience with the power outage I endured. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris and, and Katie both. I'm going to put up our last slide here, which has um, Katie and Chris's contact information. So if you wanted to take a photo with your phone, you could do that. Or we also have these, these webinars recorded. So once they're up on our NOAA Live Alaska webpage, you can access them. Um, and I wanted to let everybody on the webinar know that next week we're taking the week off for Thanksgiving. And so just check our NOAA Live Alaska website for our next web webinar. And um, I really appreciate Chris and Katie, you guys being on and being able to share with us all of your experiences and the great scenery from, from Ketchumac Bay. Hey, Lisa, this was really fun. And I really appreciate your help and Chris's and Paul, all the folks behind the scenes to make this work. Thank you very much, too. And thanks everyone who chimed in. It's uh, been fun. All right.
thanks everybody. Have a good Thanksgiving next weekend and we will we will stop things here.